Is slavery, which was part of our past and is part of our present, likely to be part of our future? Abolitionist Kevin Bale says yes and no. He'll explain next on Global Perspectives in the first of a three-part series on modern slavery. This is Global Perspectives with Pulitzer Prize winning commentator John Bercia. Welcome to Global Perspectives. Why has slavery become one of the worst problems of the 21st century? Abolitionist Kevin Bales, the author of a new book on the subject, Blood and Earth, offers a sweeping perspective. Welcome to the show, Kevin. Great to be here, John. Tell us how you got into the business of human trafficking. Did this just happened one day, or did you sort of ease into it? Well, when you say, I got into the business of human trafficking, it sounds like I came in the wrong way. But <laughs> I think what you mean is, how did I begin to study and work along yes. against human trafficking? Against human trafficking and modern slavery. I, you know, I, I had done human rights work as a student and so forth, but I picked up a, a leaflet one day at a public event that said, there are millions of slaves in the world today. And I was so surprised. It was in the early 90s, and I was so surprised by this figure that I actually thought it couldn't be true. But as a, as a social scientist, as someone who really wants to study this kind of thing, it sparked my curiosity. And I spent many years after that first digging to figure out if there were millions, because I thought if it were true, it'd be astounding. And if it weren't true, it should be debunked. Uh, and, and the more I looked, the more I found. And then I went into the field to look even more closely. And then I found a lot of people in slavery. And when you see people in slavery, it's very motivating. Help us with terminology. A lot of people call this phenomenon human trafficking. I prefer to call it slavery. Uh, sometimes you see both used. What, what is your perspective? Well, I think the thing that we're talking about is that situation in which one person completely controls another person. And they use violence to maintain that control. And the point of that control is exploitation. It could be economic exploitation or sexual exploitation. Now, that state of being that a person is in, where, where they have no free will, total control, violence being used to maintain it, historically, and I mean all the way back to the beginning of human history, the name for that is slavery. Oh. We got a little confused, I think, in the 20th century when people began to think that slavery was over, that it had been finished, and, and that the end of legal slavery, such as occurred in the United States, they believe that when that came to an end, then slavery came to an end. But you know, that's like saying people stopped committing adultery when the Ten Commandments came down. It, it, it didn't work like that. And in fact, around the world, slavery's never stopped. And I think we ought to call it by its real name. Human trafficking, on the other hand, which is a very powerful image, is normally, to my mind, how a person comes into slavery. It's a mechanism by which a person would be delivered into a state of being which we would call slavery. And of course, most of the people around the world that we would call enslaved don't necessarily arrive there through a process of human trafficking. Millions of people around the world, for example, are in still in hereditary forms of slavery. Tell us about hereditary forms of slavery. What, what exactly does that mean, and how prevalent is it? Well, in terms of the precise prevalence, it's hard to say. But I think we could point to 20 or 30 percent of the people in the world who are in slavery might be in hereditary forms of slavery. Certainly, there are millions of people in slavery in hereditary forms in places like altogether uh, Pakistan, India, Nepal, where, we, where it's especially prevalent. The, the fiction that's often used is one of debt, so that you know, your family takes control of my family in part through giving us some money but five or six generations ago, maybe for some medical needs, maybe just for food to eat. But in re return for that advance or loan of money, what you get, and this is what's why it's called collateral debt bondage slavery, uh, you get us as collateral. In other words, you say, you don't have any assets. You don't have any bank account to put up as a collateral. So I'm asking for you, your family, and all the work that you do to be that for me to hold as collateral. Well, as you can see, if you own me and my family and all the work that we're capable of as collateral and you hold that, there's no way we can get out of that trap. And then the debt and the slavery, and really it's just the slavery, passes down generation through generation. 
So people in these conditions essentially live out their entire lives working for the slave master. Their kids don't go to school. They're, they're, there's really nothing for them other than the, the slave labor. Well, that's exactly right. The, there are virtually never schooling for children. There's rarely medical care. Uh, the situation is such where people are born into slavery. And, and I have to say, there's a, there's a special sort of division among the people in the world in slavery today between those who are enslaved after they're born in freedom and they know what freedom's about and those people who are born into hereditary slavery who have no concept of a free life. So that you, if you visit a village, for example, in northern India where people are in hereditary slavery and you say, you know, where's the school? And they are saying, well, we've heard of a school, but we don't know exactly what it is. You say, well, have you been to the town that's, you know, two miles off? And they've never been off the farm. And they have no understanding of reading and writing, often even of, of money. What they know is work and food and very little else. And, and assault, physical assault and sexual assault, usually by the, the, the family that owns them. How do we arrive at these numbers? How do you estimate how many slaves are in a particular type of activity? And, and how do you estimate how many are out there altogether? Well, the, the measurement of people around the world is actually in some ways easier than estimating how many are in each type of enslavement. So our numbers about how many are in debt bondage, how many in commercial sexual exploitation, those are pretty rough. And they have to be based on secondary sources for the most part. So how many arrests have been made? How many, how many people have turned up in a, in a rough census of agricultural workers and so forth? In terms of the prevalence, though, across the entire world, we're, we're now at a breakthrough point. Uh, we've been able to, with significant contributions uh, from a, a, a foundation, to employ the Gallup World Poll. In other words, you know, the, the phenomenal research expertise of, of the Gallup opinion polling company. They conduct surveys in every single country in the world every year. And we're able to now, in poor countries of the world, the developing world, use random sample surveys done at the grassroots level. Not that go around and say, are you a slave? But where they say, in your household, in your extended family, has anything like this happened to anyone in your family? And it turns up a lot of people because they say, well, yes, my son, he's been gone for so much time. He's gone to work in Qatar or Kuwait where we were, used to be in that situation when we were still controlled by this other family. And, and it begins to give you not absolutely precise numbers, but for the first time in human history, we have accurate, dependable, reliable numbers of how many people are in slavery in most countries. Why do the numbers vary so much depending on, on the source? I've seen the total number listed as being as low as 20 million and then some other estimates 50 million and then you use something around 35, 36 million. Mm -hmm. Uh, what, what accounts for all those differences? A lot of that, accounts, there's two things that account for those differences in numbers. Though we're actually standing right now on the edge of, of all of those differences coming to an end. We're, we're at a moment where the organizations that are putting out different numbers are beginning to agree a methodology and a definition. So the key problem in the past has been how do you define slavery? The ILO, for example, who talked about 21 million, they don't use the term slavery. They talk about forced labor because that's part of the mandate of the ILO. Uh, but the other part is about the methodology. It's only been in the last three and four years that we've had the power of random sample surveys through Gallup and some other new statistical techniques which give us much more accurate numbers. So while there have been numbers in the past and people have argued about them as they should, all of those are beginning to coalesce. Uh, it tends to be that the number, the final number goes up a little bit every year, but that's primarily because every year our microscope gets a little, mm -hmm. little more precise and we're seeing a few more. We don't actually think slavery is growing when we, when we jump from 27 to 30 to 35, we actually think we're just seeing it better. How has your thinking evolved since the time you first started working on this subject? And you have been one of the major forces in defining the field with books such as Disposable People, Ending Slavery, and A Slave Next Door, and now your, your new book, uh, Blood and Earth, which we'll talk about shortly. But how has your thinking developed? Well, I have to say one of the things that I wish I had never said in my first book, In Disposable People, was to lay out this idea that there was old slavery and new slavery. Mm -hmm. 
it, I put it, at, it, there was a chart in the book where I said, you know, old slavery looked like this and the slavery of today looks like that. And I made these comparisons and contrasts. And, and when you know it, you know, every journalist in the world saw that chart and yeah. said, that's the key thing that I'm going to put into my article. And then it became, went from being just an illustration of difference into this major conceptual categorization. And it's one that within a year of that book's publication, I began to realize was wrong. That in fact, uh, I had been in my more simple understanding of the time, because I was just learning about the field, uh, I, had, I had been, to help myself think it through, I had, I had begun to see things in a dichotomy, but it wasn't, it was a continuum. And the ideas that there had been some things that were unique to slavery of the past were, was blasted when I soon got into the field and found exactly those things repeated over and over again. A, a classic example of that has to be, if, if you may know the work of Douglas Blackman, who wrote the Pulitzer Prize winning Slavery by Another Name, and it was about how hundreds of thousands of African Americans were enslaved after the Civil War through a, de a false debt legal system called peonage. Now, it's a brilliant book that he's done. I, I, I think it's fantastic. But I can also tell you that I was reading that book when I did, while I was doing research in the Eastern Congo just a few years ago, and I was talking to people who had been caught up in slavery in the Eastern Congo, and I would ask them to describe to me how they came into slavery. And they would, it was as if they had been reading Douglas Blackman's book, because they were, it was almost as if they were quoting the testimonies of people who had been caught up in peonage in Alabama in the 1880s, because their words were virtually identical and the processes and the mechanisms of false debt through a false legal system of peonage were precisely the same. But interestingly, of course, I, when I asked, have you ever heard of peonage? Have you ever heard of what happened in the United States after the Civil War? They had no clue what I was talking about. You've encountered a lot of slaves in conditions of slavery and, and you've talked to many who managed to escape and who became the survivors, essentially. Uh, what, what was the, the most difficult slavery situation that you ever witnessed? I, undoubt, I, in many ways, the, the, by far the most uh, difficult situation was when I began to do research in, in this field, and it was in Thailand. And it was when uh, I was studying a, a working class brothel in the north of Thailand. So away from sex tourism, away from the big cities. It was, it was a brothel where where working class Thai guys would come and, and buy sex, normally in the evenings, normally when they were drunk after being in the bars. I, I worked with a, a British colleague who was, she was a, a professor of Thai language and literature uh, at, at the University of London. And so she, had, she spoke perfect Thai. And we were introduced into the brothel by a Thai HIV AIDS worker who vouched for us to this very violent and criminal pimp who controlled these teenage girls. We would, on his recommendation and with his, uh, his surety that we would bring them back, um, take a, a girl or two away with us in the afternoon when they weren't so busy. And you know, the pimp and the girls assumed we were just this kinky Euro couple that wanted to take girls back to our hotel and do something with them. But after we'd, after we'd leave the, the walled and the barbed wire compound where the brothel was, and we'd go into the street, my colleague would speak to them in Thai and say, little sister, this isn't what you think it is. We don't want to have sex with you. We, you know, she would speak in their own slang and say, you know, it's not about that. We just want to do what you want to do. We just want to talk. And these teenagers, 15, 16 years old, would, would immediately say, can we go to the temple? Because they wanted to go to the temple anytime they could to pray that they wouldn't get AIDS. And then being Thailand, we'd have a meal because everything happens around food in Thailand. And they would warm up a little bit and open up a little bit and we'd hear about their horrific lives, torture, ma gang rape, murders right in front of them. If a girl got out of line, they'd be shot right in front of them as a, as a lesson. I mean, it was horrific stuff. And then we had to take them back to hell. I mean, we, we had to take them back. The, it was clear that the HIV AIDS worker, they'd made it clear the pimp said, you know, if you don't bring them back, I kill this guy. And we had no choice but to return these teenage girls to a, practically a, a certain death. That was terribly hard to live with. 
And it was terribly hard to live with because there was nothing we could do about it. Afterwards, in a sense, to help myself recover from that, I began more and became more and more engaged in actual work that got people out of slavery so that I could at least balance those things up. But there was a, I reached a point when, even as a good journalist, as a good researcher, just watching was untenable for me. How do you answer the question that some people may pose about the work that you do? Because obviously you're enlightening people everywhere you go, but what, what are some of the more measurable benefits uh, from your work that you could share with us? Measurable benefits? Well, I, I, I hope there are, there are many ways to measure, but, uh, and, and I don't normally think of them as measurable, but I, I suppose I'd have to point to uh, laws that have been passed, I, I, can, I can point to several laws that have been informed by the research and, and working with other people, of course. Everything from the California Supply Chain Transparency Law that came out in 2010, which has been a big impact on uh, keeping slavery out of company supply chains. That's now, that's now been inserted into the British Modern Slavery Law, which I worked on that as well and worked with other colleagues. And every time we can improve the, the nature and the quality of law enforcement, since Slavery is a crime in every country. That's, that, I think, is a very important measure. And then work with companies. Uh, there are a lot of companies that want to know how to keep slavery out of their supply chains. And, and they need help and guidance as well along that line. And then it's also just, you know, if, if I do a good job as a writer, if I do a good job as a teacher, that's the great joy is there's some bright, wonderful student who brings energy and a commitment to things, and they go out and change things. Tell us about uh, Blood and Earth. I've read all of your books, and this one is as good or, or better than any of the preceding ones in, in, in many ways because it gives you real insight into some very specific case studies, and, and it does what a good book should do, which from the very, very first sentence, the first chapter, it pulls you in, and you don't want to stop. So what, what led you to write this? It wasn't something that you did over just a year or two. This was a long time. And it was about seven years. And thank you for saying that, because of course every writer is terrified that they're not going to be able to pull people in. And you never quite know until, the people, until readers really begin to read. Uh, this is a book that it took a while for me to wake up to what I was seeing in the field doing work on slavery. And you know, a long story short is just that I began to I begin to see that slaves were being used to accomplish a lot of terrifically damaging, destructive activity in the environment, to the environment. So the slaves were being used to destroy the, the natural world. And at the same time, I was seeing people who were being driven to slavery or driven into high levels of vulnerability to enslavement by losing their homes and by losing their livelihoods as a result of climate change and environmental destruction. And that, when I began to see that as in this country and another country and so forth, and began to look at it systematically, I discovered that that, that relationship was much stronger, much deeper, and much larger than I had ever imagined. And I also discovered that the primary power behind it that, that was driving it was in fact consumption in, in the rich north so that the destructions of mangrove forests, which are crucial to reducing CO2 in South Asia, was being accomplished to supply North American, Western European taste for shrimp. And forest destruction in Brazil was often to supply charcoal to the iron industry there that then is made into the cars and plumbing fixtures that we use. And it goes on like that, all around the world. About seven years I spent traveling the world and, and looking deeply at that but looking particularly at how, not just that these two problems are linked together, but how the fact that they're linked together opens up new opportunities to solve both. Tell us about the most startling revelation of this research, and I'm thinking specifically about the relative size of slavery uh, and, and, and its, its overall well, impact. Yes, in a, in, a, in a nutshell, one of the things that was a very, I have to say it was a big surprise when I worked through, I, I didn't expect the impact to be so great. But if, if slavery were thought of as a country, if you know, the population of people in the world who are in slavery were thought of as the population of a single country, that would be a country the size of Canada in terms of population. Or if it were a state, it would be the state of California. 
if we took their economy, if we took the economy of slavery, we, you know, the ILO and others estimate slavery generates about $150 billion a year into the global economy, which in the global economy is a tiny drop in an ocean. So it would have the GDP, the gross domestic product of Angola, or if it were a state, it would have the GDP, the economic output of Kansas. So we're talking about, a, if slavery were a country, it would be a small, poor country. But when it comes to CO2 emissions, primarily through deforestation, slavery would be the third largest emitter of CO2 into the atmosphere after China and the United States. And it would be by far the largest emitter of CO2 into the atmosphere per capita, even greater than the Americans, who are seen as you know, the world kings of CO2 emission. Uh, tell us about what you think the next step is going to be in dealing with slavery. Um, it sounds like you, and, and based on your past books, you have an idea that it could be resolved over a generation or a generation and a half with the right effort, but then it might not be. So uh, it, it sounds like your answer about will this end could be yes and no. Well, certainly, can we bring slavery to an end? Uh, you know, it, the answer is yes if we choose to, and especially if we put in sufficient resources to it. That's been the biggest problem. Certainly in the last 20 years, we've learned very well how to bring people out of slavery in different types of situations. Now, admittedly, wars, slavery in war zones is very difficult because doing anything when there's armed conflict going on is very difficult. But most people in slavery are not in a war zone, and, and we know how to bring them out of slavery. But we don't have the resources to, to scale up to that size. We know that we have an estimate of somewhere around $20 billion over a 30-year period might be what it takes to, to bring people, most of the people in the world, out of slavery. But the important thing about this new work is that it also simply opens up this possibility that if we enforce the law that's on the books, and every single country has a law against slavery, if we enforce those laws against slavery, and especially when we focus those on areas where slaves are used in environmentally destructive ways, then we begin to get more bang for the buck. We begin to get CO2 reductions. We, need to, we, we begin to protect endangered species. We begin to re reduce the, the destruction that pushes people into vulnerability. And that increases their economic well-being and viability. That makes them harder to enslave. So it becomes a virtuous cycle instead of a vicious cycle. How do you deal with the, with the naysayers? Uh, if you go back 15, 20 years and you try to talk about slavery, most people either were confused or didn't understand what you were trying to discuss. And many of the skeptics have gone away, especially in the last you know, decade and a half. But there are still some out there. How do you? persuade them that this is a problem? Or are some just you know, impossible to persuade? I, I'm not desperately concerned about naysayers at this point. I'm more concerned about, about helping people to understand that this is a problem that's solvable in the same way that smallpox was once seen as impossible. And now it's, it's eradicated. And we're on, we're on the edge of eradicating polio on the planet. And th this isn't obviously about vaccinating and inoculating. But it is about the fact that we know that when, if you do it right, people come out of slavery and they pretty much become unenslavable. That once they're stable and, and knowledgeable of their rights and have a way to support themselves, they won't be taken back to slavery. So in some ways it is about a vaccination and now it's about scaling that all up. Well, Kevin Bales, thank you for your work as an abolitionist and thank you for joining us today. It's been great, thank you. And thank you. For Global Perspectives, I'm John Bercia. We'll see you next time.